When a spirit of vengeance enters the battlefields of the Civil War, all bets are off. And then we travel to Chile to meet a young mother who was having a good time kayaking with her friends. Everything was going according to plan until she died and then came back from the dead. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. Hope you guys are having a great day too. Hope you guys are finding some way to beat the heat. Coming into Dead Rabbit Command right now on the back of a crazy crustacean. It's William Wilson. Everyone give a round of applause to William Wilson. He's on this little crab. I read the other day that the voice of Sebastian the crab died. Actually, that's a good lead-in. It's a good segue. Later. <laughs> Not gonna segue right now, but we're gonna talk about death this episode. But did you hear that? The voice of Sebastian the crab died recently. And I know I'm really bringing down the beginning of the show. I'm like, remember that childhood song? All those childhood songs you love so much? William's sitting there. He's looking at this crab. He's saying, oh, it's dead. It's this dead crab. William. <laughs> William, you're going to be our captain, our pilot of this episode. If you guys can't support the Patreon, that's fine too. Just help spread the word about the show. That's how you do your part to expand the Fluffle family. Talk about it on Instagram, Facebook, wherever you guys hang out online. That is how you support the show as well. William, we're going to toss you the keys to the Dead Rabbit Dune Buggy. This is another vehicle we haven't used in a while. Toss you the keys to the Dead Rabbit Dune Buggy. We're leaving behind Dead Rabbit Command. We are headed out to Fletcher, North Carolina. Ding, 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 ding. William is driving us on out to Fletcher, North Carolina. The year is 1865, and the Civil War is on. Oh, I got shot in the stomach. I got shot. And we're just, we're just driving through a dune buggy. We're watching the war between the states. Brother, kill brother. Father, killing son. We're eating crab. We're just eating crab legs. Ah, oh, help us. They're reaching for us. A group of Union soldiers is getting their butt kicked in the town of Fletcher, North Carolina. And so the order has been given to retreat. Now, 1865 is towards the end of the war, if you don't know your U.S. Civil War history. But it, not everything, not every single battle was going smoothly at that point. The war was still on. The Union would eventually triumph. But in this particular town, the South had the upper hand. And so the Union troops are retreating from town. And they know, you know, when they invaded the South, it was a lot of guerrilla actions on this part of the Confederacy. And you had a lot of locals spying for the Confederacy, giving out troop positions and things like that. So they knew that this wasn't a necessarily just a military route. There was other factors that caused the Union to have to flee the city. So when they see a young woman on a horse wearing a Confederate cape, it's like the big wool gray capes that the Confederate soldiers would wear. They see her galloping away on this horse. The commander of this particular platoon of soldiers goes, okay, let's get her and figure out if she knows anything. His eyes go from side to side. They're going to execute her. But technically, he just says, we'll interrogate her as he's trying to shoot her in the brain. She's riding away on her horse. The Union troops are riding after her. And it's really, it's a win-win for the Union troops. They got to leave town anyways. And she's headed on the way out of town. And she gallops past Calvary Episcopal Church. Clop, 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 clop. And then the Union troops, clop, 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 follow after her. They can't catch her. No matter how close they get to her, she always seems a little bit farther away. And again, at this point, <laughs> they've stopped trying to catch her. They actively have their guns raised. They're trying to shoot her as she's galloping away. But they can't even get in firing distance of this woman. And then the woman vanishes. And then all the Union troops kind of look at each other, right? They pause their horses. <laughs> One of the horses was the Crypt Keeper. And they go, sir, did you see that? And the other one's like, I sure did, Jimmy. Th that was super bizarre. People shouldn't have just disap... Oh. And then he looks down he, in mid-sentence. He was so rudely interrupted by a projectile going into his stomach. Oh, how rude. And then the other Union soldiers are like, I'm taking a very long way to explain. For some reason, I don't know why I'm dragging this on so long. 
all 20 soldiers are massacred on the spot. Slow motion bullets. They died. They died right there. It was a Confederate ambush. Or was it? The Confederate troops were just kind of hanging out. But when they see the troops galloping, they get in position. And when the troops ride by them, they open fire, and it's completely uncontested. All these Union soldiers are killed. 20 are killed on the spot. Now, of course, some get away, and they tell the commander, yeah, this woman is definitely helping the South. She's wearing a Confederate cape. She led her men into an ambush. And the general goes, Dagnab it! Do whatever it takes to find this woman. And the, the, the guy technically should have said, oh, should have added the part where she disappeared into the ether. And general's like, what? We should have, said, should have led with that part. Uh, there, a woman disappeared that we were trying to follow. Let's go back in time even earlier. It's the year 1861. It's April. The Civil War is a few weeks away. Rumblings in Washington and rumblings in whatever the capital was in the South. I, I, there was a Confederacy, so there is a bunch of different capitals. But you had rumblings all over the place. People were talking about shooting each other in the brains. People always talk about that. People were talking about shooting their own family members, their own countrymen in the brains. They were doing it for years and years and years. And now we're just a couple of weeks away from the start of the Civil War. A young couple, we're going to call the man, Jeremiah, we're going to call the woman, Melissa. They just get married in North Carolina. And they only get a few weeks of marital bliss before the knock. It's a bunch of young men from town, and they're like, hey, Jeremiah. It took him a second to remember his name. It took him a second. They almost called him Johnny. Hey, Jeremiah. Before you draft someone into the war, it's polite to know their name. Hey, Jeremiah. You ready to fight for the South? You ready to fight for the Confederacy? And Jeremiah goes, you know what? Yes. You <laughs> didn't take a lot of convincing. He was a total pushover. Yes, I will fight for the Confederacy. And so... Molly, what was her what was her name? Melissa. <laughs> Melissa doesn't want him to go. But Jeremiah, we've only been married for a couple weeks. You can't go. That's her argument, not the fact that they're fighting to have slaves, not that they're fighting to keep this hor- horrible mechanism in place. Oh, well, we can talk about that later, but we've only been married for a few weeks. She can't do this. And Jeremiah's like, listen, Melissa, I know that war is scary, but... It's also kind of rad. So I might come back with just like a little bandage on my head. Or I might come back <laughs> I might not come back at all. I might be blown apart by a cannonball. You just don't know. That's, that's what makes war so exciting. So he waves goodbye to Melissa. Joins the Civil War. He goes off with this group of young men. And they're singing a jaunty tune. And not long afterwards, Melissa's at home alone. And she's like, hmm, I wonder what Jeremiah's up to. I wonder if he's gotten that cool scar yet. It's a knock at her door. It sounds a little more like a feeble knock. Sounds a little distraught. She sees one of the young men who came to the house not too long ago to recruit Jeremiah. And he's covered in bandages. Uh, They probably could have sent a better... They probably could have sent a better messenger to deliver this story. Not the most gruesome survivor of whatever happened. They could have at least sent like a gentleman... They sent the mummy, they sent Mumra out. And he goes, listen, (laughs) I know you were kind of promised a sexy scar. Yeah, the Civil War is not that great. Um, It's not going to turn out really good for us in the end either. And your husband, Jeremiah, was killed on the battlefield. I was about to say blown to bits. I don't think anyone would say that to a grieving widow. But I want you to have this. And the bandaged man, the bandaged man who appears in several urban legends after this, the bandaged man holds up a heavy gray wool Confederate cape. And he goes, your loved one Jeremiah was wearing this when those Yankee bastards shot him. So here you go. Here you go. Hope you know how to clean it. It's covered in blood and gore. He gives her this Confederate cape, and she wears it all over town. She's like, at the grocery store, people are like, dude, we know that you miss your loved one, but could you please clean his brain out of that wool? No, this is still a part of him. 
There's rats following her around. It's like a really twisted Disney movie. She never remarries. And well, she doesn't remarry because she died a few months later. She's like, oh, that bandage man. I, I bet he was cute underneath all those bandages. She definitely doesn't remarry. She dies a few months later of a broken heart. And then we have the first sighting of her was four years later. When these Union soldiers were trying to get out of town and they saw the phantom of a woman wearing a gray Confederate cape in front of them. To this day, people of Fletcher, North Carolina say you can still see this woman riding through town. Her ghostly steed clip clopping down the city streets after sunset. Her heavy Confederate coat still riddled with bullet holes. <laughs> Again, that was a horse, not a Crypt Keeper noise. This is part of, like I said, this week's theme is, I hope you like ghost stories. And I do hope you like ghost stories. I love ghost stories. We don't cover enough of them on this show. We talked about these all week long. And I've talked about how ghost stories are like urban legends and how ghost stories are created and things like that. We're really not going to go into that deep of it with this thing. Because there's some other interesting things going on. One, once again, for the third time in a week, and I've said this so many times on the show, it's super rare to find a ghost connected to the death of a human. Three times this week, we've covered ghosts that have had, in one way or another, a hand in the murder of a human, or in her case, 20, 20. This woman's racked up quite the body count. So the story stands out just because of that. Very rare that we come across, and now we're coming across them a lot. I think before this week, we might have covered three total. So that's fascinating. Whether or not it's historically true, I really wasn't able to find out. There, there are some issues I have with it. One, I mean, some people just say ghosts don't exist, Jason. That should be your biggest thing. But I do believe ghosts exist. But it, it has to. Ha there's a bunch of things that have to happen. We don't have the name of this couple. If this woman was actually responsible for the slaughter of 20 Union soldiers, people should at least remember her name, right? But I do just find this story interesting. We have a spirit of vengeance. And it doesn't have a happy ending. I was hoping, as I was reading this story, I was hoping, even, again, even though she fought the South and got all these young men murdered, I was hoping that in the end she would find her ghost dude. Like, he would show up. He'd, he might be floating around like Casper, and they're riding on that horse together. Like, But no, it's just such a dismal ending. William, I'm gonna go ahead and toss you the keys to the Carpenter Copter. We are leaving behind Fletcher, North Carolina. And we are headed out to Southern Chile. <laughs> So when I was talking earlier about the guy, I mean, it's so funny. I said Sebastian, the one guy who voiced Sebastian the Crab died. I don't even know his name. But, I mean, obviously, like, that was a dope movie. It's bummer, right? Because we all know that voice. We all have listened to those songs. I think anyone could sing Kiss the Girl or Under the Sea by heart. Maybe, maybe it's a generational thing, but... But at the same time, it's funny because I've talked about this on the show before... I have this weird thing with death where I overthink it, where I absolutely overthink it. Because I think life is so awesome. Life is so amazing that I can touch all the molecules of the wood and like some tree died to become part of this closet and like I can touch it. And you know what I mean? Like it's just all the stuff like tasting food and sunbeams on your skin and things like that. Because all I know is being alive. And I value life. So when someone's not alive anymore, I can't comprehend that. And I, I'm Christian, so I have a belief system. Like, I believe that when you die, you go to paradise. But I don't understand what paradise is. Like, are there streets? Is there gravity? Is there sunlight? And if it's sunlight, can you feel it on your skin? Is it ever too hot? Is it ever too cold? Because these are all things that happen in real life. And when it's too cold, or when it's raining outside... I'll grab a blanket and I'll cuddle up. <laughs> Apparently I'm a grandma. But you know what I mean? You never think of drinking hot cocoa on a summer day. But when it's stormy outside and it's kind of cold, that's when you think, oh, I wonder I wonder if I have any of that Swiss mist left. And you look and it expired, it expired two years ago and you're like, I'll take my chances. You don't do that on a summer day. so Yeah, yeah. 
The only time you ever eat Del Taco is when it's 3 in the morning and everything else is closed, then you're stoned. No one, no one eats Del Taco under any other circumstances. So I overthink, like, the physics of death. Now, some of you are atheists. I have a lot of good friends who are atheists or agnostic, and they just say, when you die, that's it. So I just enjoy life, and I know at some point it's going to end. That, I just don't, I can't comprehend that. I can't, like, I mean, obviously, I'm still their friends. I'm not like, ah, running away from them. We have good conversations. We don't talk about it all the time. But I've had good conversations with my friends who don't share my belief system. But I, I just, I have a hard time comprehending it. And I can only think when somebody passes away, I hope they're in a better place. I believe they're in a better place, honestly. I believe they're in a better place. My idea of, like, redemption and paradise and things like that, I, I think are a bit different than other people. Even other people who share my religious beliefs. But that's I've talked about that on the podcast before. I've done too much of an intro. But I, I when Sebastian the Crab, when the voice of Sebastian the Crab dies, I go, I hope that man's in a better place. I hope he's in a better place. So when I come across stories like this, on the one hand, it it's very abstract to me. And on the other hand, it is nice. It's 1999. We're in southern Chile. Dr. Mary Neal, she's a mother and an orthopedic spine surgeon, is kayaking with her friends. Wee! Splash, splash. Wee! Splash, splash. They're like, what are you, seven? Wee! She stops weeing at a certain point because her kayak actually goes over a waterfall. Now, that was planned, apparently. It was part of the Daredevil tour she was on. But when it goes over the waterfall, she actually goes underwater. And the water is, like, pushing her down. It's keeping down the kayak. She goes 10 feet underwater. And the power of the water... Maybe this wasn't planned. <laughs> maybe this was an accident. They're like, loser, see you at the end. See you at the end of the river. She goes off the waterfall. I'm assuming accidental now. And the power of the waterfall is actually keeping her underwater. She gets submerged, and she's stuck underwater for 12 minutes. She's under there for 12 minutes. They can't get to her because the power of the water is pushing her down. They end up calling rescue crews. I'm sure she was a doctor herself. She's probably hanging out with the other doctors. But an EMT rescue crew does get to the area. They pull her out of the water, and this is how they described her, quote, Blue, waxy, no heartbeat, no breathing, cold to the touch, dead. That's when they pulled her out of the water. It was another 12 minutes she went without oxygen. She is resuscitated. Zero brain damage. It's like she took a deep nap. Now, I read that. And I called, I was like, this is BS. On the one hand, it has a lot of stuff I really like. Specific names. Job titles. I love when there's job titles. What did Jeremiah do before the Civil War? No, it's very, very specific information. Dr. Mary Neal. The date isn't specific. The location, Southern Chile, is not super specific. But I read this and I go, this sounds fake. You can't be dead. You can't not breathe for 24 minutes. She was underwater for 12 minutes. Maybe she held her breath for the first two or three. But still, there's another 19 minutes that she's not breathing. It's not true. This story is so well documented. Like, I originally found it on this website I love, anomalien.com. But when I looked into it, she was... Okay, I'm not saying that this is the most reputable website, but she was on Oprah. She was on Oprah.com. She was on HuffingtonPost.com. And then, though, she's this story is in the clinical oncology dot com website as a medical journal. This is a real story. She did come out of this with absolutely no brain damage. So you go, what what happened to you? She's she's like, well, I was in a kayak, and I went, no, no, we know about the kayak thing, but you didn't breathe for twenty four minutes. You were dead, cold to the touch, dead. Very, very famous story. She's told this many, many times. And you could say she's faking it. But it's pretty hard to fake not breathing for 24 minutes. She's standing in a place that she describes as so beautiful, it had, quote, 
No earthly equivalent. This place was pure bliss. She sees, a short distance away from her, a huge domed structure. And she can't wait to get there. She doesn't know what's in there, but she knows this is her new home, and she can't wait to find out what's in the dome. She gets there, and she sees what she describes as beams. They looked like people, but she could tell there was something that elevated them above Mere humans. They were wearing robes. Very, very traditional garb that we find in religious ceremonies all over the world. And when she entered the dome, she felt their love. They were so joyful. They were so happy to see her here. They told her they were there to guide her and to protect her. They would always be there to guide her and protect her. But she's not ready to go with them. It's not her time. Now, Dr. Mary Neal, she has her patients that she cares about. She has her family that she loves. She has her children that she birthed into the world. She loves more than anything. But as she's in this domed structure, she's looking at these people. And they tell her, it's not your time. You have to go back. She refuses. I want to stay here. I don't want to be alive anymore. This is where I belong. But it's not her time. And they actually force her. (laughs) Actually, these gentle spirits have to force her to go back. They don't say it was physical force. They're like, we'll guide you. All right, we'll guide you back to the land of the living. They do force her to go back. They say, you still have work to do. You still have to take care of things. And, Mary, you need to know something. Your oldest son, Willie, we're going to see him before we see you again. He will pass away. But we want you to know that he's going to be here with us. And we will guide and protect him like we are meant to guide and protect you. Mary starts breathing again. She is, once again, alive. She begins to share this story to her loved ones. Because that was obviously the first... Even the doctors that were there were like, what was going on when you weren't breathing for 24 minutes? She would share this story. But she always left out one detail. The death of Willie. Maybe this was all just a dream, and there's no reason to alarm anybody. Maybe it was the fading synapses firing their last bolts of energy that created this image. Maybe if she never mentioned it, it wouldn't come true. Ten years after the event, she's told this story hundreds of times. She actually writes a book about her journey. After she finishes writing the book, ring, 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 ring. She gets a phone call. She picks up the phone. She finds out that Willie had just died in a car accident. He was killed by a distracted driver. Someone was fiddling around on their cell phone. Killed her son. The story of Dr. Mary Neal is a fascinating story on many different levels. One, just on a medical story. Somebody coming back to life after 24 minutes. We've come across stories like that before. I don't think I've ever really covered them on the show, but just in general, people being frozen, people who should have died. I'm not talking about, like, they barely avoided a giant wheat thresher coming at them, but people who were frozen and their heart rate dropped so low and they couldn't breathe for a long period of time and then once they're thawed out, they're totally fine. I'm wondering, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm wondering how cold the water was, if it was able to slow down her heart rate or brain activity. That was one of the reasons why she lived. But just as a medical story, it's an interesting feat. It's a miracle, really. It's a miracle. Then we have the idea of the near-death, or in her case, death experience, right? She did die. She was cold to the touch, waxy and blue. 
And she sees these beautiful images, which is what you want to hear, right? This is, isn't, I, I think even someone who didn't believe in an afterlife would go, well, if there is an afterlife, that is pretty cool. It's just beautiful and love and peace and people are there for you. And I would love for that. I think everyone would love that type of afterlife. The imagery may be different depending on your belief system, but just that sensation of belonging. Something, you know what I mean? So we have that. And then the prophecy. The death of a child, I, I don't have children myself. The, the idea of having children absolutely terrifies me. To me, that's one of the scariest things. I talk about being turned into a human pig. I talk about, that's really my main concern, is being turned into something against my will. Like, turned into a tree or a rock or something like that. That's the scariest thing. Second scariest thing, zombies. But the chances of either of those happening are... For me, they're higher than the average person, but still they're not the most common thing. Having a child terrifies me. All of my friends have had children. All the friends that I grew up with have all had children by now. And the thought terrifies me to have a little person that's so fragile and stupid and weak. <laughs> I basically become Omni-Man yelling at my son. They're so weak. And anything could kill them. They could step on a rusty tack. Stuff that I could bear. Stuff that has never killed me. Stepping on nails and getting attacked by wild animals and coming down with diseases and stuff that have never, ever, ever killed me could kill my child. And that terrifies me more than anything. I don't even have kids and I'm scared of them dying. I can't imagine what it would be like to lose a child. I can't imagine that. But. I can't imagine that because my idea of death in the afterlife is based on faith. I don't know. I want to believe that great grandma McGee, who I love so dearly, and grandma Miller and grandpa Miller and aunt Rosemary and uncle Danny and aunt Jackie and all, all these people that I loved throughout my life who have passed on. I hope they're doing good. I hope they're in a better place. I hope my uncle Jeff is healed. I did a whole episode on him, and I hope that the tragedy he went through is healed now. And he's in this blissful place. But it's faith that I believe they are there. I don't know. And I won't know until I'm either there or I'm not. Total faith. But Dr. Mary didn't have to have faith. It's horrible that she lost her son. But she has to know where he's at. She has to know he's there in that place right now, enveloped in pure love. Some of us can just visualize the afterlife or hope for that type of paradise. But Dr. Mary Neal knows for sure. It's a sad story on a physical sense, but it's a hopeful story on a spiritual sense. Dr. Mary Neal knows that her son is being taken care of. And she knows she will also someday return to that place. And we can all only hope that her vision was real. And pure love awaits us on the other side of death. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be here. Don't try rushing it either, guys. I know things might get rough sometimes. But you still have work to do, too. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at Facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. Twitter is at DeadRabbitRadio. DeadRabbitRadio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. Take care of yourselves.